and uh, we're very excited. You got some new stuff here today, so tell us what the Orange Box is. Uh, the Orange Box is sort of a new collection of uh, products that we're coming out with for three platforms. Uh, it's Portal, Team Fortress 2, Half-Life 2, Episode 2 are the three new games that will be in there. Also included is full version of Half-Life 2 and Episode 1. And it'll be PS3, 360, and PC when it comes out this fall. For the PC is the black box. PC also has okay. a black box, which is just the three new ones because the other games have already been available on the PC, so there's some people there that we wanted to not charge double for stuff they already paid. So the black will be about 40 and orange will be about 60. Tell us a little bit about Portal and how it came to be. Portal is really the work of a group of students that were at DigiPen up in Seattle, actually just on the east side of Seattle in Redmond. Um, seven students did a senior class project called the Bacular Drop, which is still available, I think, off DigiPen's site for free if people want to check it out. And some of our people went to the senior class showcase, which is basically like a job fair that DigiPen invites local developers to to try and pick off some of their students. And some of our guys saw them and invited them all over to demo it for us. And Gabe basically stopped them about 10 minutes into the demo and said, you guys have to come to Valve and build the next thing that you guys do on Source. So that was about 18 months ago, and now they're showing Portal. So tell us a little something about what makes Portal different. I think what's cool about Portal is that uh, with Half-Life 2, we introduced the gravity gun, and it sort of made you think differently about objects in the world. The portal gun, in a similar way, makes you think differently about the world itself. So now you can manipulate the space and take objects through new holes and spaces that you create in the world. Portals. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, for us, it's sort of, it's great because we're able we're having the same playtesting experiences that we had with the gravity gun where we set up a puzzle and we know sort of one or two ways that you know we would fix it or that would be the design ways to, to play through it and to solve it. And we see people come in and do stuff that we had no idea would even like work. And so that's great. So for us it's even fun to watch people play it and then sometimes those things spur new ideas like wow that person did that that way maybe we should set up a puzzle that you know gets people to that so that they have that experience too. So it's, it's fun uh, for us to design and create and also to sort of continue that tradition of bringing new people out of either the mod community or the schools to come and join Valve and you know work with us on their projects there. We get to be fanboys. So. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, Team Fortress 2? Well, Team Fortress 2 is uh, you know nearing uh, completion, at least of the first version. Um, again, it's coming in the orange and black boxes. Um, we spent a lot of time working on uh, the roles of the nine player classes and sort of uh, evolving those quite a bit uh, for different reasons. Some for, uh, we weren't happy with the previous designs completely of some of the characters such as the medic and uh, perhaps the scout a little bit, became just a flag runner ultimately. And we've made changes there so that the medic has a more important role on the field, that the scout can also be a bit of a combat threat as well as just a flag runner. You know, some subtle changes there to the gameplay. We've also made some major changes to other characters because of what we can do with the Source engine. So uh, the Demo Man, for example, you know, has physics and obviously, you know, his role is much different now. So we've done a lot to sort of exaggerate the gameplay of some of the characters in line with what the technology can do, redesign some of the characters, space those characters apart so that the experiences are more dynamic, and obviously, you know, building new gameplay types as well as uh, remaking some of the classics like 2 Fort and Dust Bowl. Cool, and are we expecting um, all three consoles to see the release at the same time? Yep, that's the plan. Great. So what are we looking at as the online situation for the Xbox and with the other consoles? For each of the games, uh, we're looking at unique ways to tie into the different sort of online platforms or online backbones that are connected to each of them. And in some ways, that's really where the different games will, or the different versions will vary the most. Because like, you know, the award stuff that we can do on 360 is unique to the 360. So we're looking at ways to sort of customize the experience uh, for those gamers on each platform there. Um, Stats and rankings and things and TF are things that we feel are really important for folks as they play in clans and do tournament play. So linking that into uh, you know those systems is an obvious one. Uh, the achievements and how quickly you solve things and the way you solve things and how many portals you use to solve games and stuff like that are ways that will play into those systems as well. Um, and so each game sort of has its own unique you know gameplay style and therefore they'll tie into things like achievements and points. Uh, you know 
tailored to their experience and tailored to the platform that they're brought out on. And what are some of the challenges that you found bringing, you know, classic PC games to the console? Well, we've been doing it sort of. Uh, Ongoing, you know, we brought Half Life 1 to the PS2, we brought Counter Strike to Xbox One, and Half Life 2 to Xbox One. So we've spent some time here sort of figuring out, like, you know, what are the choices that you have to make, what are the differences with controllers, and what have you. What's nice about this run, though, is that we're doing all of them simultaneously. So we're thinking about the console stuff in step instead of after the fact, which is always the case before. And we're at a really sweet spot with the, the platforms we've chosen. The PS3, the 360, and the PC right now are pretty close in terms of what they can do if you're engineering your stuff correctly. So we should see pretty you know, even performance and feature sets across the board. And things will really come down to the online services and what those are capable of, the controller and what those are capable of, and obviously on the PC. On the highest end, there'll be you know greater resolution to be had for those guys. Catch an all new X Play weeknights at eight only on G4. Hey G4, it's Doug Lombardi, VP of Marketing at Valve, and we're here to talk about Portal 2. It's been a long time. How have you been? Yeah, so the Sony uh, PlayStation 3 uh, announcement was a really big deal for us here at the show. It was one of the, the biggest uh, things that we were doing. It was the big surprise that we were hinting at before the show. Uh, and we're really excited to bring the game to the PlayStation 3 platform with Steamworks enabled uh, to provide uh, more frequent updates and deliver Portal 2 as a service to customers rather than just a standalone disc that gets shipped when you know day one happens and then we forget about it. Um, we've been moving towards entertainment as a service with our products through Steam on the PC and this will be the first time that we do it on one of the next gen consoles and we feel that will make it the best version on any of the next gen consoles. When the PlayStation 3 first came out, you know, Gabe was very vocal about some criticisms, but I think Sony's done a really, really good job of proving that you know the PlayStation 3 is going to be an open platform. It's going to be a forward-thinking platform and one that allows developers to do the things that they want, delivering both their games and their services. And for us, that was really the big thing that turned it around. Being able to deliver Portal 2 on the PlayStation 3 with Steam involved makes all the difference. Portal 1 came out in 2007 as part of the Orange Box, and for us it was a bit of a trial balloon, if you will, or a test to see if this new play mechanic would resonate with gamers. And obviously, you know, it was sort of the darling, if you will, out of the orange box to our surprise and went on to win over 30 Game of the Year awards. So that test, if you will, of the smaller game proved to us that gamers wanted more of it. And we heard from folks that they wanted more story, they wanted more interaction with Gladys, and they wanted multiplayer. So we you know, started working pretty much immediately on Portal 2 at that time with a small team that's grown since then and sort of really addressing the things that customers wanted to do, wanted us to do with the game as we took it forward and also do some of the things that we sort of restrained ourselves from doing the first time because we were trying to keep it to just a test and part of the orange box rather than a full standalone product. So now Portal 2 is going to be twice the size of the original game in terms of single player plus a co-op multiplayer game that's a completely different story and gameplay that is also twice the size of the original Portal. So you're going to end up with over four times the amount of uh, the first game with multiplayer as part of that picture. The story is being penned again by Eric Wopaw, who uh, was sort of the maniacal genius who, who wrote the first one, and he's really sort of, uh, you know, uh, personalized that story and, and the relationship between you, the player, and Gladys, and trying to expand that much more. Uh, we're also trying to take you sort of back backstage, if you will, at Aperture and give you a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes and how Gladys is changing the test chambers and just allowing you to do a little bit more exploration in addition to the puzzling that goes on in the game. You know, that obviously opens the door for more story as well. In the first game, we definitely uh, made the environment more sparse and a lot of that came from playtesting because we were introducing this new play mechanic we saw from playtesting that a lot of the clutter and the other things going on were detracting people's attention from the core gameplay uh, goals and the critical path. So we actually removed a lot of stuff and left you in sort of that sparse, sterile environment. Now that we've experimented with that gameplay and we feel like we have a better handle on it and taught over three million people who played the first game how to play this game, we feel that we can expand a little bit more, make the environment a little bit more uh, rich, um, and, you know, 
in addition to that, bring out sort of that element of exploration and let people go behind the scenes and sort of, you know, read the writings on the wall and peel back more of the story. One of the big new things is driving the story further, and a big vehicle for that is going to be some of the new characters that we're introducing. The one that we've revealed here at the show is a, a personality spear named Wheatley, who is uh, trying to break out of Aperture uh, and has sort of grabbed you as... Uh, his personal escort, because he's a personality spear, he needs help getting around, and uh, he's sort of your aid for unlocking things, and he's also a huge uh, point of comic relief as well. So he's got some, some great lines, both in the demo and in the full game, and we saw that people really got attached to that companion cube in the first game, and we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we gave you some more companions that might actually be able to talk and, and deliver some more stories? So that's sort of the big idea behind uh, those characters, and there's more of them, not just Wheatley. One of the big goals for the gameplay was to not just deliver more of it, but to make sure that we weren't just making it harder, right? Because Portal had this really nice ramp, the original game, of introducing you to the idea and introducing you to the story, and then at the end of it, you were doing these insane things that you, know, you would have never been able to get at the beginning. And so in Portal 2, we got a lot more mechanics that we're introducing. We're able to sort of manipulate the environment and add the gels for speed and for jump and things like that. So it's a new type of challenge, uh, and we're introducing those challenges, and then we'll start layering those in a similar fashion as we did in Portal 2. So there's a lot more puzzle types, a lot more mechanics for solving those puzzles, and the ramp that we bring players into that is going to be key to whether or not it's an enjoyable experience for folks or not. And on the first one, we spent... I think probably 10 to 12 months just testing the product once we had the core pieces together. And we're going to be taking that care with this one as well to make sure that folks, you know, feel like they got their whole experience and they saw all of it with a nice gradual ramp. Portal 1 had one of the highest completion rates of any game that we did. So many people made it to the end and saw that, you know, that great finale and the song and whatnot. And we want to make sure that we get people there with Portal 2 as well. The gel stuff that we're showing here in the demo today was uh, another great pickup for Val from DigiPen Institute, uh, the guys that did the tag game. Yeah, you spotted that. So uh, we met those guys at GDC a couple of years ago, and they've been sort of working on that technology, and there was just sort of a point in time where there was this crossroads that was like, wow, this would fit really well in Portal 2, and, you know, they kind of got excited about it working on Portal 2 and the team you know, got excited about having them and their, their tech in the game. So I think it's a really good fit and I think it's one of the nice sort of highlights, if you will, of the new features uh, that's going into the game, especially on the single player side. When we finished Portal 1, one of the biggest responses we heard from players was that they loved it, they wanted more of it, and they wanted a multiplayer component. And so, you know, some original ideas of, you know, deathmatch with portals and stuff like that went around. But as we looked at it more closely, we saw that people were kind of playing Portal 1 as a co-op game just with one controller. So the idea of making a co-op, you know, mode or game, uh, you know, for the multiplayer component just made a lot of sense. And we've got a lot of uh, experience now making Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 and learning how sort of people play co-op and how they approach that and what are the things that you can do to make it feel like the player's right next to you on the couch even if they're across you know, the internet in New York or whatever and you're in California. So we're doing cool things there like giving players a button to be able to see through the view of the other player that they're playing with. Again, sort of trying to make that couch next to you on the couch experience uh, feel like it's always there whether you're actually physically with the person or you're playing with them over the net. And with each product that, that you make, uh, there's lessons that are learned, and Valve is very, very fortunate in having the ability to sort of take our time to put games out when we feel they're ready, and also to choose projects that we want to work on, um, and the teams actually decide and drive that. And so that allows those lessons to carry through from product to product. So things like, you know, saying with Left 4 Dead 1, okay, if we're going to build a co-op game, we need to build it from the ground up as a co-op game, not a single-player game that then we run you back through it with a buddy playing the same game with more monsters on screen. And that test came back with a lot of really positive results. So when it came time for Portal 2 to get, you know, to work on their multiplayer stuff, we were able to look at the co-op stuff, and we made the decision pretty early on based on the learnings from Left 4 Dead 1 was that if we're going to make a co-op game for Portal that's cool, for Portal 2 that's cool, we should just break it off and have it be a different story, different set of characters, different set of levels, different set of challenges, and just design the whole thing from scratch as a co-op. And a lo another part of that happens with the ability for people to move around from team to team at Valve. We don't just have people locked in the TF2 room and locked in the Portal room and whatnot. You'll see people move around. So there's people from the Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 team that have moved over to Portal 2 and are sort of working on some of that stuff. So you actually play as two robots in, uh, one of two robots, in uh, the co-op game. And they have their own story that sort of runs parallel to the Portal 2 single-player story. So there's 
you know, pieces of overlap. So if you're, you know, really hardcore into the story, you're going to want to go through the single player thing and then play through the co-op thing because there'll be little pieces of story there that are additional and, and enhance uh, the story in the main single player game. Portal 2 is coming to the PC, the Mac, the PlayStation 3, and the Xbox 360 in 2011. I think we can put our differences behind us for science, you monster. Playability. You have the various scenarios, but how different can each experience be if you play through the same scenario you know, multiple times? With Left 4 Dead, we're using this thing that we call the AI director, which is sort of managing all of the AI uh, systems in the game and monitoring the player's progress through the game. You know, each time through, it also takes a look at difficulty. So the AI director will be mindful of that and say, okay, these guys are learning how to play as a team. Let's crank up the difficulty. Now, uh, with the AI director and it's scaling the difficulty given on the skill of the players, how will that you know, scaling of the difficulty manifest itself inside of the game and how the enemies react? It should be seamless to you. So it's really in sort of a rock, paper, scissors kind of thing in terms of how much we're scheduling on people. Is it a horde of 15 plus two boss infected? Is it a horde of 10 and one boss infected? Is it just the horde, et cetera? So there's sort of a lot of devices, if you will, that allow us to sort of um, mix and match the population based on the skill set and sort of still be able to give the players that intensity without overwhelming them, hopefully, is the goal. One thing I want to touch on, if the game is coming out on the 360 and it's coming out on the PC, is it just because of the nature of your engine, it doesn't cooperate well with the architecture of the PlayStation 3? With Left 4 Dead, it's a new title, it's kind of a risky property, and no one's really stepped forward yet to say, hey, we want to make a PS3 version. If someone came forward and we liked the team or what have you, we'd probably do it. But internally, we're a PC and a 360 house, so that's what's being made right now. I cannot tell you how excited I am for Left 4 Dead. Awesome. Always great talking to you. All right. Great to see you again. The orange box is a new type of uh, product skew, if you will, that puts five games in one orange box. Um, the games are Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 1, Half-Life 2 Episode 2, Portal, and Team Fortress 2. Two recent classics and three new releases. The three new games, you have Episode 2, which is the story-driven first-person shooter. You have um, Portal, which is a new sort of um, experimental style gameplay that mixes puzzle, first-person, and adventure gaming and then Team Fortress 2, which is the multiplayer piece of the orange box. Episode 2 is the second in a trilogy of new games that, once it is finished, will sort of represent the sequel to Half-Life 2. And basically what's happening is, at the end of Episode 1, Alex obtained a data packet, and you as Dr. Gordon Freeman must escort Alex and the data packet across this wild area known as the White Forest, and the Combine, of course, are trying to stop you along the way. Being the second in a trilogy, it's very rich in story and sort of accentuates the conflict in this trilogy. So you'll find out more about the G-Man, his motivations. He'll reveal that there actually is a relationship between he and Alex, and one of the lead characters in the Half-Life universe so far will unfortunately die in this episode. Portal is a brand new type of gameplay that comes to us courtesy of seven brilliant students out of the DigiPen Institute in Redmond, Washington. They developed a game called Narbacular Drop as their senior class project, and at their senior class showcase, which is a way for DigiPen to get their students recruited. Some of our uh, employees went, saw in the Drop, invited them to Valve, 
demoed the game to us, and Gabe stopped them about halfway through and said, you guys have to come work at Valve and make your next game on Source Engine, and that is Portal. Basically, the gameplay is such that, like the Gravity Gun challenges you to think differently about using objects in the world, Portal challenges you to think differently about the world itself, how you can manipulate the world with portals to get yourself and other objects through a series of 24 3D obstacle courses. You play as a new character in the Half-Life universe, and along the way, you'll reveal how that character fits into the universe. And in episode two, there'll also be made reference to the Aperture Science Lab, which is where Portal takes place, where you, as sort of a laboratory rat, must complete these 24 challenges by proving the technology of the Portal device. So the orange box will be available on three, Xbox 360, and the PC, October 9th of this year in North America, and October 12th in the rest of the world. We have now yet another reason for you to beef up your gaming rig. Valve is launching a new level in Half-Life 2 that puts the competition to shame. And today, Valve's Director of Marketing, Doug Lombardi, is here to tell us all about it. Doug, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having appreciate me. appreciate it. So uh, you're here to tell us all about the, uh, the new uh, expansion pack to Half-Life 2 that you're working on, where you get to play as Alex? Uh, no, that's rumor. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. Now, you're actually here to talk about uh, Lost Coast, right? Right. Lost Coast is a new uh, level or mission, if you will, uh, that's really focused on new technology and pushing the envelope in terms of visual fidelity and the artwork that's in the game. Right. Now, one of the technologies is HDR, which I, I guess you're, you're going to do a great job of explaining this to our viewers at home because I'm completely confused. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to give it a shot. So, uh, in addition to sort of just pushing the envelope and letting the artist really push really high resolution, Resolution textures and sort of forget about any minimum spec uh, um, requirements or what have you and just targeting the high end only. We're also introducing high dynamic range lighting or HDR as it's called. And so to sort of help explain that, I brought in a couple pictures and whatnot that All we're right, taking we a look at here. So as you can wow, see, that looks great for in game. <laughs> These are actual regular photographs, ah. and you can see as the amount of light that the camera's f stop is allowing to hit the film, uh, the exposure changes, and so the brightness get really really, really hot and the dark spots get really, really dark. And so basically in a very simple sense, what HDR is doing is th bringing that to the game and when you look at something that's light, your eyes will adjust to that for a, a second and the details will wash in and out with it. And not only will the light affect you as you look at it, but also if you turn around, the things that the light is being cast onto will also take on those properties as well. Ah, so now, how is that fundamentally different than the light bloom effect, which other people, uh, other games have used as well? Well, the light bloom effect is sort of like a, a baby step towards really doing HDR in the complete sense. Okay. Again, if you look right at the light bloom, there's an effect that's happening, but if you turn around and look behind you, it's completely static. So they sort of focused on where you were looking for a second to give you an effect or a taste of HDR, but really didn't populate the whole scene or light the whole uh, set uh, with HDR completely. Gotcha. Okay, so now you brought a video with you. It's what everybody's been waiting for online, <laughs> I think, so we might as well show it. Okay. Uh, what are we about to see here? So we're just going to take a look here at one of the pieces in uh, Lost Coast. You're inside a monastery here, and what we've got going here on, wow, on camera is a before and after. So on the left, you can see with HDR switched on, you're getting great glows. You can see sort of the hot properties on the floor there where the really direct beams of light are sort of giving you sort of a glow effect on the floor. On the right there you can see it switched off and it's obviously much darker and less fluid. Um, you know, if you talk to Hollywood directors or people who build sets and you say what's the most important part of bringing a set to life, 99% of them will tell you it's the lighting. And really what we're trying to do here with HDR is to sort of bring games that much closer to having a realistic environment by working with the lighting. Uh, we've pushed polygons on characters, we've added more characters on screens, sure. we've made bigger maps, but we haven't really attacked the lighting yet. And that's sort of the next step here that we're, we're biting off. Well, it looks, I mean, it looks absolutely gorgeous, but what's this going to cost us in terms of performance? I mean, is this only for the highest of high-end machines? Absolutely. <laughs> it yeah. is. No bones about it. This is targeted 
at the super hardcore early adopter guy or gal who's got the latest and greatest stuff and really sort of the horsepower to haul you know, these new APIs and, and new lighting tricks. Now, how does, how does something like HDR compare to the lighting system in a Doom 3 with the dynamic lighting? HDR is, is dynamic, correct? Right. I mean, they're all sort of fancy names for doing basically the same thing from the end user's perspective. Now, the magic that's going on under the hood and how we're accomplishing it is different. They're taking a different approach than we are, and I'm sure Epic will take yet another approach in their next generation of Unreal games. Um, it's probably too early to say who's doing it best. I probably have my own bias, uh, given the, the name on my shirt. But I think the good news for gamers is that everybody who's doing something interesting with gaming technology is moving this forward. And I think what it's going to do is give us more realistic environments and new gameplay implications. And that's just ultimately good for everybody in gaming. So the ability to do HDR style lighting is, is within the Source engine. It's, it's built in there, right? Right. So with, can modders take advantage of this? Ab or? Absolutely. With this update, not only will we be releasing the new Mission Lost Coast to all Half-Life 2 owners for free via Steam, but we'll also be doing an update to Half-Life 2 so that it will get some HDR effects and we'll be adding this technology to the Source SDK so that mod authors can use it in writing their Source or Half-Life 2 mods. Oh, incredible. So uh, now I want to switch gears for a second. You've had a chance to see the latest NVIDIA and the latest ATI cards, right? Mm -hmm. At least the, the cores of the cards. Yep. Uh, can you tell me who, who do you think is going to take, uh, take the lead in the next-gen console race or perhaps who's your favorite right now? Well, I think, I think what we're seeing right now is something that's really interesting. Traditionally, we've seen companies come out and establish themselves as the firm dominant leader in the, the GPU or the graphics world. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of get complacent. Their technology sort of goes a little stale, and you'll see a competitor come in and knock them off the throne and take that position. With ATI and, uh, ATI and NVIDIA, we're seeing a bit more of a dogfight where they're both pushing each other, and neither one of them is sort of letting up the throne for too right. long. I've seen PR reps in the alleys actually beating each other with, <laughs> that's with right. broken bottles. So. It's fierce. They're friends, but they're also very fierce competitors. And I think, again, that's good because while they're forcing each other to move forward to have that competitive edge, we as software developers are getting new technologies to write to, which in turn gives gamers new experiences and greater senses of realism and better graphics to Fantastic. enjoy. All right. Well, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, real quickly, feel free to, to give our viewers the release date on Team Fortress 2. Go for it. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> ah, all right. All right. It, the, we should mention that the, it is a free download on Steam, yep. the Lost Coast level. Lost Coast coming in just a few weeks for free to all Half-Life 2 owners via Steam. Doug, thank you so much for coming by. Thanks we for having appreciate me. it. Thanks for explaining the HDR goodness. For more info on Valve, check out their website. Of course, it's valvesoftware.com. And like we said, the, avail the level will be available through Steam for free in the near future. Now we're going to be taking your calls from Master Case Modder.